first and foremost, feeling pretty good after a fairly active last 24 hours. Uh, very interesting rumors. Bills were clearly at least semi-active, at least working the phones. Mike, what is your quick opinion on how the last 24 to 48 hours have gone for uh, this Bills roster? Turned out pretty well. You get a guy like Rasul Douglas, that's about as good as you could have hoped for going into trade deadline day. Obviously giving up a third round pick, getting a fifth in return. Uh, I'm pretty excited. Cornerback was obviously a hole on this team ever since Trey White went down. And if you're going to replace him with uh, a trade acquisition, you got one of the better available corners in the league and someone that it, at the very worst is a top 25 to 30 corner uh, in this league, maybe even better according to his pro football focus grades. And the way he fits the scheme, the way he fits this Bills defense, it should be a solid addition to this Bills secondary. Yeah, it's an interesting move. I mean, it was by all accounts reported. I have inside people um, that I trust and others have reported that the Bills are after corner. They were after it pretty, pretty strongly. Uh, Jalen Johnson was a top target of the Bills. I would seemingly think that a contract would have came with that. And they just didn't get there. The Bills did not feel comfortable enough without a second year involved in the contract. And we've seen this even with Naeem Hines last year. We've seen this in the, even Calvin Benjamin in the early days of Brandon Bean. We've seen this him liking term on his traits. He does not like to give away assets, especially one that's decent for any type of one-year rental. So you saw it uh, this season specifically where he wasn't feeling confident enough that he could get a deal done with Jalen Johnson and basically said, we're going to pivot um, and pivoted to Rasul Douglas, a guy that came on late third round draft choice, um, you know, was in and out of lineups early on in his career. Kind of reminds me a lot, Mike, of Leonard Floyd, a guy who had a lot of good draft tape, a guy that you expected something from early on, but just took a little bit to get going. Um, now, Leonard Floyd's definitely one of the best pass rushers in the NFL, and Rasul Douglas is absolutely as every bit as good of a corner. I've watched him film already. Every good as bit of a cornerback, one that you want. Is he a top 10 guy? Probably not there but he's definitely fairly close to that ranking of being an easily top 20, top 25 corner that you're looking for to add to any roster that already had a budding star in Christian Benford uh, across from him. And then the eventual return of Trey White, probably next season, obviously, but the eventual return of him and his contract. And the funny part about him, Mike, uh, Russell Douglas, one year, $9 million option next year for the Bills. Fairly reasonable and a fairly easy option to work around if you'd like to keep him and or redo something with them. So Brandon Bean probably felt pretty, pretty great about a single digit in the millions, a cornerback one next season that uh, he felt comfortable enough swapping a third for a fifth. The trade value calculator says it's around a fourth. Um, and, you know, Brandon Bean has no issues dealing with fourth round value as he seems to do every year, moving away from that to get Dalton Kincaid or Kyer Elam uh, doesn't seem to bother him. And guess what, Mike, we're going to have a fun draft day three special here on the going deep podcast. Because last year we had two picks. This year we're going to have seven picks. We're going to have a fourth, two fifth, three sixths, and a seven. So we're going to enjoy the draft day special, uh, day three special this year, Mike. Um, but just off face value, there's some data that I want to go over in a minute. But your reactions are Brandon Bean went out and got, you, got a cornerback one, I'm assuming? Yeah, this is what fans wanted. Fans wanted a move. And I could tell throughout the day, a lot of people were getting impatient, getting frustrated. Obviously, Jalen Johnson was at the center of the rumors. Uh, would have been incredible if the Bills could have uh, grabbed him. But uh, obviously, in the same that bad of a consolation prize, uh, if you're going to get someone else from the NFC North. And just a few random numbers. I, I'll let you go more into the metric side of things. But Rasul Douglas has six interceptions in the fourth quarter or overtime since 2021. That is the most among cornerbacks. Obviously, uh, Greg Thompson, this was one of his targets going into trade deadline day. His 75.2 PFF grade ranks 21st of 129 cornerbacks with a minimum of 100 snaps overall. I'll let you go into some of the deeper numbers, but this is a guy that has played very consistently. Uh, solid football over the last three years with the Green Bay Packers. Before that, uh, there was a little up and down when he was in Philadelphia and his single season in Carolina. But this is a guy that will instantly come to the Bills defense and really fit in to what they're trying to do. Uh, I, will he start this Sunday? That's probably a tad bit fast for me. I mean, I expect him to be out there, but starting probably not this week, at least at this point. Uh, but 
you're talking about the rest of the year. Your secondary is now back to being one of your better strengths uh, going forward. When you lost Trey, there was some worries. Uh, obviously, there was concern about the safeties. Are they taking a step back? I think it's clear through the last few weeks that Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer, they're carrying the team in the back end. Benford has been doing a solid job. Same with Taron Johnson. Now you add a guy like Rasul Douglas. I think it's safe to say your secondary is one of the strengths of this squad again. If they can get a guy like Daquan Jones back on the defensive line uh, prior to the playoffs, assuming the Bills make it to the postseason, you essentially have your entire defense back minus Matt Milano, who they're still holding an outside hope that he could come back at some point late in the season. So after a day like today, you don't want to automatically jump and say things are, are great and perfect again, but you definitely start feeling a little bit more positive about what this defense can be going forward. You have to, and you mentioned some PFF grades. Just to cap that one off, 10th in coverage in the NFL at the cornerback position, a tick better than this year than Tredavious White was before he went out, and right there with the likes of Sauce Gardner and better than Christian Gonzalez so far this season. Uh, So it was a very interesting trade where, honestly, I had heard Razul Douglas come up a few times, and I didn't think that Green Bay would – he had a very cheap minimum contract this year. Bills are only going to pay about 800 k a uh, very doable contract against, and they, they, the Bills felt really good about Jalen Johnson's number this year too. And that's kind of what sparked the interest there. But I didn't think that they, the difference there was I didn't think Green Bay, especially for a three, five swap. I didn't think that they'd want to let go of that next year option. I know things went South on them this year, but man, really going from like call it the 90th overall pick, just roughly to about the 140th overall pick. I mean, there's a little value there, But Bean was still able to calculate that and knowing that he has about the 97th or 98th overall pick there as well and the compensation pick for Tremaine Edmonds. So ultimately, great value there for the Bills. At first, I I, I was told to me a third and a five. I thought that that was okay, but but expensive. But then once I found out it was a third for five swap, that's when I was like, okay, yeah, that's that's a fairly good deal. Brandon Bean came out well. Uh, just for next year's option alone, and then the bonus of having him as a kicker this year for half a season, those two combined, one or the other is decent value. But the fact that you have that option next year and then the ability to have him for this run uh, were two really good combinations that I thought he could have been a trade target for the Bills at the end of the season. But to be able to get him at that price point on a minimum deal for nine games – uh, is pretty good value. And to go into a few more statistics about Razul Douglas that actually preaches to his availability that he doesn't really miss games. Banged up Bill said he's only missed two in 2020, and that was for COVID-related things. Uh, doesn't miss football games, which we know this regime puts a really strong importance on, especially knowing the injury rash that they've had over the last 12 to 14 months, starting with the Thanksgiving Day game uh, in New Orleans with Trey White. And then ever really since then, they've kind of had a little bit of rash of injuries. But some better stats for you, 26 in passer rating against in the NFL, uh, 59.5, 15th in yards per coverage snap, only 0.5. It's a really good uh, meaning that he's really good at covering people and not having the ball thrown his way. 64%, uh, 64th in completion percentage, meaning that really no big plays are ha- being, being had in front of him. 31st in points saved. 29th in EPA per target, negative 0.18, meaning that every time you throw his way, it's a negative 0.18 from a cornerback. Very good. It's top 30, obviously. And 19 in busted coverage percentage, uh, seven, only 17.4% of the time. All, all those numbers combined, mixed with, if you like PFF, mixed with just some of the raw box score stuff with the interception stat you had. And all of a sudden, you have a pretty complete trade candidate that really, he's a pure example of someone that developed in his tenure. He isn't somebody that started fairly strong. He switched teams a lot from 2019, 2020. There was some movement in there that many had said is a day two, potential day two bust um, that we've heard about, like the AJ Epinesa mold maybe. But these guys just do develop, and they do figure it out after three and four seasons. It's not just Dalton Kincaid. It's not just Gregory Rousseau where you got it right in the first eight games. Sometimes it does take AJ Epinesa. Sometimes it does take two and a half, three, four seasons, Mike. Teams give up a little bit too early. And something the Bills didn't feel quite comfortable with giving up Kyir Elam yet uh, when there was some rumblings, especially with the Josh Norman benching and now the eventual replacement of him by Russell Douglas, um, that, you know, you'd have to assume and then Dane Jackson's obviously there, too. 
Well, so really Dane got replaced, who had replaced Kyir, uh, which is music to my ears. Uh, but Mike, how do you feel about the Kyir Elam situation? As this was pretty, pretty easy to assume they could have flipped him for a fourth or straight up for this deal. So what is your opinion on holding him now? Obviously, he's going to be a game day inactive. But what's your opinion on, on this Kyir Elam situation where he's just going to be sitting uh, without a jersey on game day now? Yeah, I was fine with Brandon Bean going either way with Kyer Elam. Uh, if he needed to part with him in order to acquire someone solid, like a Rasul Douglas or Jalen Johnson, I was okay with that uh, because you'd be making the team better now um, in exchange for a person that really doesn't have an immediate future on your team. But I don't have any issues holding on to him. Um, you can still uh, believe in him and try to – take whatever you can out of his development to try to maybe hope that you can salvage something uh, next off season. And if you can, maybe there is a possibility that Elam could still work his way onto the bills um, onto the field in the future. Uh, obviously the hope level isn't that high, but maybe Bean wasn't quite ready to, to give up completely on him. Uh, but this being said, it, it doesn't look good for Elam going forward. Now that you have, three solid corners on this team once Trey White returns next year. Obviously, it's a big question. What type of player is Trey White going to be when he returns from this Achilles injury? But assuming that he makes a full recovery and he's out there, now you have a, a one, two, three. That is Trey White, Rasul Douglas, Christian Benford. You don't really have room for Kair Elam as the fourth corner on this squad unless one of them makes a move to safety. But as for this team right now, uh, I, I think it puts the corner room in a good spot where now Dane Jackson goes back to where he most likely should be, and that's be your primary backup corner. There's never a, a really an issue with Dane Jackson coming up in the event of an injury, but to have to rely on him on a weekly basis, that's when you get into some trouble um, with his, his limited ceiling. So I think this kind of puts things back to where uh, you want uh, the rotation to be if you're a Bills fan or if you're one of the, the Bills coaches. Yeah, and very solid overall addition, and especially at this price point. I was worried they might have to overpay in a situation that was talked about San Fran, who botched a, a, a acquisition of a Dory Jackson from the New York Giants, which was very interesting. In days of technology, people are still somehow botching trades. I don't understand how that's an issue. I don't really know, like if, if the teams agreed to a deal, I don't really know where this is falling short for teams, but apparently that's still happening in the NFL in the year of 2023. But the Bills obviously had competitors. Uh, there was much talks that the Bills may be interested in a, in a, in a one tech. Uh, was there any discussions around Leonard Williams, a guy we saw go yesterday with a restructured contact, uh, contract? Did they make a call for Jonathan Allen? There was, there was much discussions that they could have, at least as of yesterday, been working the one tech phones and realized early on that they didn't think that a deal was going to get done at that position. So let's put whatever resources we've allocated to this trade deadline to the corner room, which presented itself fairly early in, in, in a way where they went after Johnson right after the Sunday night football game from all accounts uh, that I've heard so far that that was their, one of their top targets. And I'm assuming Rasul Douglas uh, working the phones with Green Bay in the back burner uh, to make sure that that value didn't present itself, which it ended up doing. So that's a pretty exciting time. And what's really great that you mentioned, Mike, the big physical nature of a player like him, just like Benford. Benford is he's one of the best coverage corners. Now, once he gets a few more hands on balls and or breaks up a few more things, he's going to be an elite level corner because that sticky coverage is something you don't overly see often. Uh, and the way he made the play at the end of the game uh, in Tampa, just play after play and even made the play against Mike Evans that just happened to ricochet off his helmet um, and just just poor fashion, just unlucky fashion, the way, the way that 18-play drive went to end the Tampa Bay game with a face mask penalty, with a ticky tack. It's almost like um, the ref said target Taron Johnson after that Giants victory because that was ticky tack. That guy ran his route right into him. It, it was before five yards, but in the initial contact, that is not a legal contact by definition. That's that's a guy that ran his route deliberately at Baker Mayfield. Never looked that way to extend a drive. I hated that call. Um, the face mask was a face mask, a terrible play by Jordan Phillips. I don't know what he's thinking. You just stand there. It was stand there and the game's over um, and uh, botch that. But it took a couple of weird instances, a deflection off a helmet. 
Um, but Christian Benford in, in all accounts was locked down against Mike Evans. And that's just a guy I'm not moving to safety at this point. He is your starting corner for the foreseeable future uh, based unless something crazy happens. He's your cornerback. You know, he's battling cornerback when he was guarding Mike Evans, one of the best receivers in the NFL. People forget just because he's on like a bad Tampa team right now or or below average Tampa team, how good Mike Evans really is in his physical nature. He's a pretty good player. He is he's in the corner one status and we'll see if he's able to elevate uh, to a top 20 uh, person. And I am I agree. I am not somebody that likes to convert very rarely like an Aaron Williams or others. Do I like to convert a safe a corner to safety? I don't see it. I don't see Trey White going there. He has the instincts. He has the read and react. I just don't know that he has the total frame and build and box nature tackling ability of a Jordan Poyer or a box safety. I just don't really see it. Could he replace like a Micah Hyde? That's a little more realistic, but I just don't think he has that those total safety uh, measurables that you're looking for. And I do think they run back Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer for one, at least one more season next year with how well they're both playing. So I don't see the safety conversion. I don't see safety as the biggest need in the world uh, either. But I wanted to quickly show the Raz. Look at the elite size grade, and this is what the Bill's like. He's ringing in at 6'2 now, so probably even a little bit taller than uh, he was at the Combine many, many years ago now uh, when Raz basically first came out. But uh, you see his height and his weight grade, his hands and arm. He has elite measurables that you're looking for there. Outside of like a 45940, which is okay in a zone-style uh, game, He's okay in his 10-yard splits. Uh, he has average speed grade, but he's shown to put a little bit more speed on film to go with that elite size grade. Uh, and you're overly looking for round a seven Raz at the cornerback position, as our guy Math Bomb has told us uh, in the past. You're looking for a seven Raz, and that usually works out well with the instincts, like it did here with Razul Douglas. Um, so, Mike, just the overall workflow of the corner room, what you saw against a really talented receiving core of Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, and others. I thought they played well against Kate Otten, who's a pretty good tight end. He's a, he's a developing uh, young tight end himself. How did you think that they went? And now you're adding Razul Douglas, which is, you know, you can like Dane Jackson. I don't overly like him. I know you like him a little bit. But either way, you're replacing Dane Jackson with a Razul Douglas. And all of a sudden, you feel a little bit better against matching up with some of the league's best, as you've, you've already seen Christian Benford be able to do it. Yeah, I, I felt good about the way they played against Tampa Bay. Uh, obviously, an upgrade is always appreciated. Uh, as I said earlier, Dane, I feel most comfortable with him being the number three quarter. I didn't. I don't have issues with him filling in for a few weeks here or there if needed, because he can fill in and be uh, a solid. Uh, contributor when when asked upon he hasn't had a bad season this year by by any standard but this is definitely a, a true upgrade in and, and like I said earlier on the show I, I think you're going to see the defense uh, flowing a lot more effectively now uh, going forward with a guy like Rasul Douglas in in, in the slam you're getting a true uh, corner low tier corner one high tier corner two and a guy like Rasul Douglas. So you, you match him up with Benford. This is going to bring solid results uh, for the Bills defense. So any any concerns after Trey White was out of the lineup, I feel like those uh, are somewhat alleviated now with this acquisition. 